Uh, I'm pretty excited actually that we've reached the, uh, final, the, the final keynote presentation of today. Um, we've had a lot of great content today about how to influence, and I'm going to call it how to hack human behavior, how to hack organizational behavior and individual behavior in order to achieve some kinds of cultural change. Um, Jim McCarthy, who unfortunately isn't going to be with us later in the week, was talking about, he, he said something in the pre-conference webinar about how if you want to improve the quality of the work that people do, you really need to improve the quality of the relationships between people who do it. And that, I think, is at the essence of, of hacking our culture so that we can do better things together. Um, our closing keynote is going to build on this theme of culture hacking, but coming at it from a completely different direction than we've been talking about so far today. I'm really excited about this. I've, I've been waiting to hear Ray speak for a while. And, uh, and I think this is going to be a very, Martin started us off with a fairly, I'll say, slightly provocative keynote. And I think we're going to close the day with something that's perhaps even more challenging. Uh, but I mean that in the best possible way. So Ray, Ray Abelia describes herself as a, a rabble rouser and a, and a social activist. And uh, as you can see, the title of her presentation is Women, War, and Peace. One in three women will be raped in her lifetime. There are seven billion people on the planet right now, so that means that one billion 
women will be raped on the planet right now. Every two minutes in the United States, a woman is sexually assaulted. The World Bank tells us that women aged 15 to 44 are more at risk from rape and domestic violence than from cancer, war, malaria, and car accidents. 16-year-old Imrana burned in her home. 20-year-old Manju beheaded by her father. From Punjab to Basra, thousands of women and girls stoned, beaten, and buried alive each year. We should call honor killings what they really are, dishonorable killings and murders. Four million women and girls are trafficked annually. That means sold across borders for sex slaves. At the peak of the American colonial slave trade in the 1780s, there were about 80,000 slaves transported to the, quote, New World. Now the U.S. State Department tells us that there are about 800,000 women who are trafficked across international borders. A slave in the 1780s was worth about 40,000 U.S. dollars in today's money. But these girls today aren't worth more than a couple hundred dollars. Aren't we worth more than $300? Women do two-thirds of the world's labor but own less than one-third of the world's assets. Women are paid less than men for the same work. The odds of being in a high-level technical position are almost three times greater for men than for women. And women are only 13% of the board of directors at high-tech Fortune 500 companies. Around the world, women are constantly threatened by exploitation, violence, and abuse. A little more than one year ago, the brave and courageous survivor of the Delhi gang rape breathed her last. And I want to dedicate this talk to her and to other survivors of abuse and trauma. Rape cases and violence against women are unfortunately on the rise. The Indian National Crime Records Bureau tells us that rape cases jumped an astronomical 873% from 1971 when they started measuring these statistics. And we know that many more cases go undocumented and unreported. Delhi has emerged as the rape capital of India, accounting for 25% of the cases. And I wish I didn't have to say this tonight, but just the past, this past weekend, a 21-year-old woman from Assam was gang raped in Delhi, and a 55-year-old woman was raped on her way to go shopping in broad daylight. Let me say this statistic that you see up here again. One in three women will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. That's one billion women on the planet right now. Let's take a breath. How is it possible that this kind of barbaric treatment of women can coexist in the same millennia of highly sophisticated technologies and progress that's bringing us the internet, 3D computers, incredible advancements in medical technology, and space exploration toward Mars. Is it enough that a handful of women can prove themselves in a male-dominated world and become CEOs of Fortune 500 companies like Sheryl Sandberg? Or are these outliers not reason enough for celebration, given the plight of women worldwide? And what would it look like for women to be successful in business without losing feminine characteristics, which are so integral for conflict resolution, societal harmony, and the health of any company or community? And maybe first and foremost, you're starting to wonder, what the heck am I, a rebel rouser, doing at a technology conference? I think maybe the conference organizers thought, this conference is going to take a lot of emails, a lot of e-readers. Why not throw in something about equality? The topic might seem like an odd choice, it's true, given the conference agenda, which features sessions on polyglot programming, Lego play, and front-end JavaScript using Angular, JS, Jasmine, Karma, and Jenkins. But I want to make a case that maybe the people that brought me to stage really do know what they're doing. Violence against, patriarch violence against women is as old as patriarchy. Traditional <laughs> patriarchy has structured our worldviews and our mindsets, our social and cultural world on the basis of domination over women and the denial of women's humanity and full and equal rights. In many ways, the past 50 years has been a watershed of women's rights victories, and I get to stand before you and speak this afternoon because of those victories. I stand on the shoulders of the women and men that have made tremendous advancements. 
for equality. And I want to give a shout out to my mom who taught me that being feminist is beautiful. But even with all the recent successes, violence against women has intensified in recent years, taking on more brutal forms like the murder of the Delhi gang rape victim. The issue of women's rights is not a luxury or a frivolous concern left to those without <coughs> jobs who have the time or energy to be activists. No, the well-being of women around the planet is everyone's concern because our well-being depends on each other. And because it actually makes sense, as in dollars and cents, to care. So why do I care about this issue so much? Let me tell you a little bit about my personal story. I was born on election day, so I think that determined me to either be a politician or a protester. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you a pic of me as a kid. That's me with my first best friend, Mikash. We are doing what we love best, jumping around in puddles. Uh, I'm the first generation American daughter of two immigrant parents. My mom's family is from Holland, and my dad's family is from what's now Israel. My dad's parents dropped him off in an orphanage when he was five years old, and when he was a teen, he made his way to New York City, and then met my mom, and they got married at 18, and went out to California, the land of economic opportunity, beaches, and yes, technology. So yes, my dad was one of the programmers of massive machines like the Iliad 4 in Silicon Valley back in the day. And when my dad wasn't at work, he could usually be found at home drinking and shouting, screaming at my mother. I grew up in a house of broken promises, broken bones, broken dreams. My family life was traumatic and, and tumultuous, I think, but I didn't know that at the time that, that there was anything different from that. From the outside, our family looked normal and even highly successful. We were the American dream. The immigrant family who rose from rags to middle class wealth living in a seaside suburb we had the newest sports sedan. I was on the honor roll and the star athlete. From the inside, though, everything was crumbling and breaking apart. And after years of violent attacks, my mom finally got the courage to leave my father and to try to make it on her own as a single mom and a working mom. In high school, I founded a program to educate teens about domestic abuse and alcoholism. I thought if I could just reach out to one girl, make a difference in one person's life, that would be enough. But then in college, I started wondering if maybe this situation that I experienced wasn't connected to the whole world and to some global kind of trauma. So I started looking into how things got so bad in my family. My grandparents were all survivors of World War II. My mom's mom was in hiding in the basement of her Dutch home, with the Na which the Nazis confiscated. And her family lost everything in the war. Those in my dad's family, all Jews that, were, that didn't flee to Palestine, were killed also by the Nazis. My dad's parents must have been so traumatized that they couldn't deal with having a kid, so they deposited him in an orphanage and left. Of course, we each have to take responsibility for our actions and own our own behavior. But I also think there's cycles of violence that happen in families and trauma. And in my own family, I began to piece together how war affects the family. I mean, how is it that soldiers and whole countries can be violent toward a perceived enemy and not have some of that violence trickle back home, seeping into family life? And how is it that nations can promote abuse, torture, and murder of the enemy, popularize violent video games, and glorify violence on TV, and then suggest peaceful conflict mediation in the home? <laughs> so when 9-11 happened in 2001, I was a sophomore in college, and I had to act to oppose the attack on Afghanistan. I just saw the cycle at work again, and it didn't make sense. An eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind, right? In New York and Washington, D.C., we marched, rallied, protested along with the whole world, but we were not successful at stopping the invasion of Afghanistan and then later the invasion of Iraq. So after graduation, I took a job with a women's peace organization called Code Pink. And I want to tell you a little bit about my work with Code Pink over the past 10 years and what that organization stands for. It's at the forefront of projecting to politicians, the public, and the media a no war message. At Code Pink, we coordinated vigils outside the White House. We marched in the streets. We got everyday people from moms to military women to stand up. We coordinated humanitarian aid campaigns, delivering much needed medical supplies to women in Gaza and Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. 
We stage protests inside of government offices and inside of uh, our politicians' homes. Here you can see one code pinker, Desiree, telling Condoleezza Rice that the blood of Iraqi children is on her hands. We work to decrease the enormous, huge US military budget. <coughs> and we also targeted and in some cases boycotted corporations that make violent weapons. My favorite printer company, HP, unfortunately makes scanners to ID Palestinians at segregated checkpoints in the West Bank. This technology supports illegal occupation and racism. We also worked to connect the dots between the economic crash and what is devastating women at home in the US. Big banks foreclosing on homes. We asked why our government always has enough money to buy the latest we weapons and bail out the big corporations, and yet we can't provide basic services like healthcare and good quality education to our own people, the taxpayers. And we coordinated speaking tours to highlight women's voices from the front lines of war. This woman you see here is Malalai Joya. She's one of the few people elected to the uh, Afghan parliament. And she fearlessly speaks out against the US occupation, even though she receives tons of death threats and violence. And she's a tremendously courageous woman. Why do women's voices like Malalai matter in the peace process? We should look at the facts about war. You can see here that women's lives under Afghanistan, under the occupation, have not improved. In any war today, most of the victims are civilians. Those least empowered women and children suffer the most. They're collateral damage. Sexual violence exasperates conflict and perpetuates insecurity in the wake of war and holds entire communities hostage. While women have a legal right under international law to be protected from sexual violence, it's the least condemned war crime. So maybe it's no surprise that overwhelmingly in conflict regions, women are running the peace movements. This isn't just because the men are off fighting or the women don't have access to weapons in the same way. War also makes an other of the enemy. And maybe women have more compassion for the other having been othered so many times in our own societies. Philosopher Rada Ivakovich says, Traditionally, women adapt to different cultures more easily, giving up their family names and their origins more often than men when marrying into another community and are socialized into accepting the other. Of course, this is learned behavior and anyone could learn this. It's just been forced on women and have learned it quite well. We can put this another way. There's an American author and team leadership trainer, Starhawk, who writes, women have been the guardians of life not because we're better or purer or more innately nurturing than men, but because men have busied themselves making war, because of our responsibility to the next generation, because of our own love for our families and communities and the country that we're part of, we understand the love of a mother in Iraq for her children and the driving desire of that child for life. Women may be very vocal in the streets, but where are we at the peace negotiating table? Out of 300 peace agreements since the end of the Cold War, only 18 have addressed sexual violence. Why? Well, maybe it's because the dominant gender defines the interests of war and later of peace. These negotiations are done by the warlords themselves. No women have appointed chief peace mediators in UN-sponsored peace talks, and less than 3% of the signers on peace talks and treaties are women. Here's a recent example of a push for women at the peacemaking table. After three years of horrendous fighting, a death toll now exceeding 100,000 and more than 7 million Syrians forced to flee their homes. Syrian peace talks took place in Switzerland last month. Code Pink and a coalition of women's groups launched Women Lead to Peace, a global alliance of women and male allies <coughs> calling for an immediate ceasefire in Syria, an embargo on arms sales, greater humanitarian aid for refugees and those displaced, and full participation of women at the negotiations. But women aren't only victims of violent conflicts and physical assault. We're also under violent attack on the economic wars, on food, on the environment, and on natural resources. It's these wars that I came to India two months ago to study. I took a course at the Earth University in Dehradun in the north with Dr. Vandana Shiva, who explains how our current economic system engages in violence on women. In the current economic system, a woman's kitchen garden and homemade clothing for her children aren't valued since she isn't selling anything outside the home. But isn't this worth the bread and butter of life? 
A living forest doesn't contribute to GDP, but when trees are cut down and sold as timber, there is economic growth. Public tap water shared freely does not uh, entail economic growth. But when Coca-Cola sets up a plant and mines the water and fills the water bottles with water, the economy grows. This is all based on creating poverty, poverty for nature and for local communities, in which women are impacted greatly. Thanks to Coke's bottled water plant, local women are now forced to walk longer distances to harvest water for their families. <coughs> this is really heavy stuff, so I want to take a moment and just tell you a bit of a success story. In the village of Pachimeda in Kerala, Coca-Cola created a bottled water plant that sucked the local water wells dry. When the walk for water became over 10 kilometers, local tribal woman Mayulama said, enough is enough. We can't walk further. The Coca-Cola plant must shut down. The movement that the women started eventually shut down this plant. If economics is based on limitless growth in the confines of a limited world, then the powerful must grab all the resources from the vulnerable. This creates a culture of rape, the rape of the earth, the rape of mountaintops to, exert, to extract coal, of aquifers in order to frack natural gas, of acres of jungle in order to create more land for factory farming. And the rape of the earth and the rape of women are inextricably linked, metaphorically in shaping our worldview, but also materially in our everyday lives. And I want to here talk about the case of women in the Congo. The Congo is the poorest country on earth by GDP, and yet, as you probably know, one of the richest in terms of minerals and natural resources. Since colonialism, when the king of Belgium ran a notoriously genocidal regime in order to plunder Congo's rubber, armies have tried to grab at its wealth. And the latest gold mining is for coltan. Congo has 80% of the reserves of this mineral, and it's used in our mobile phones, our laptops, our iPhones. With this research in such demand, there's a direct link between technology, the consumer boom, and fighting in the Congo. Rape is a key feature of this war and it's undermining Congolese society. An average of 40 women and girls are being raped daily. That means over half a million women since this conflict started a decade ago. After being raped, a woman's usually excluded from her family and because women are so integral in the family life, doing everything from cooking, raising the children, birthing, etc., it means the whole community is quickly undermined. The particularly violent way of rape in the Congo has become the norm and destroys the women's reproductive organs. They can no longer have children. Society breaks down, and if you destroy enough wombs, you can then come right in and take the minerals. Playwright Eve Ensler says, there's so much rape in men who've been colonized and enslaved, you have to wonder what it's done to these men, to their collective psychological memory. Centuries of colonialism, slavery, and exploitation by the West have come together and are now being delivered on the bodies of the Congolese, most dramatically on the women. She says, if you destroy women, you destroy the Congo. Raping women is the cheapest and most effective way to instill fear in and humiliate a community. It doesn't even cost a bullet. And yet, in the middle of these atrocities, Congolese women are organizing from occupying the US Embassy in Kinshasa to mobilizing across the nation to stop war. In this picture, you can see some of the women that are part of the City of Joy program. This was founded by the playwright Eve Ensler and Congolese women and several key doctors who created a center for women to have refuge, to recover, to get much needed operations, and to learn key skills. Women are learning about the internet. Women are learning uh, new ways of doing business and ways of overcoming their trauma. Serving 90 survivors of gender violence aged 14 to 40 at a time, every six years the City of Joy will graduate over 1,000 survivors of abuse. When you think about it, it's a pretty great model in general, I think. Women are 51% of the global society, so empowering them will change everything. City of Joy is about creating unusual solutions to incomprehensibly awful situations. It's about empowering women rather than just giving them aid or financial help. If we accept that rape is a violent expression of power imbalance between men and women, then empowering women is a key to solving this problem. But before we get to solutions, and I promise I'm getting there very soon, 
I want to mention one more aspect of the way resource wars, transnational corporate economy, and the lack of women's rights are linked. And that's a mouthful, I know. We talked about Coltan. Let's talk about the other end of the phone and laptop production. Foxconn in Shenzhen, China. Foxconn, do you all know this company? Just a show of hands. People in the room know it. Yeah, so a few of you. We should all know the name Foxconn if we all carry around devices like these. Foxconn employs more than a million people in China. The suicide rate of people throwing themselves off the factory buildings there is so high that the company put up nets as if it was trying to catch fish. Why are young people, mostly women, killing themselves over making the latest iPhone? Faced with rapidly increasing demand, workers are subject to extreme pressures, humiliation, long work hours, and horrific working conditions. And let's not forget that many sweatshop workers around the world were driven from their rural homes by the collapse of small farming with the boom of big ag. Then they have no other option than factory work for survival. So next time you go to make a call or you pick up your tablet, we should think about these people, especially the women in the Congo and in China, who are suffering so that we can have the newest technology. Shouldn't the tech sector have some responsibility around this issue? And what do we do about the ongoing rape and violence of women worldwide? The enormities of the disease on violence and girls, on women and girls, can feel totally overwhelming. To be apathetic on the issue of women's rights, though, I think whether you're a man or a woman is somewhat suicidal. Because the reality is uplifting women is not just good for women, it's necessary for all of us, never mind that we actually all come from women. So what do we do? I don't have a magic bullet answer to tell you today, but I do have 10 suggestions to share on how to end violence on women and girls, from the family to the global community. And I wanna thank those of you in the audience that helped me out with these today. First of all, we can raise conscious children we can teach our young girls that they can succeed in any profession they choose. We can encourage more girls to enter into math and science fields. And instead of complimenting girls on how pretty they look, we can tell them that they're good learners, great leaders, awesome artists. Here's me as a kid with my dad building a dollhouse and later all the furniture for our house. Despite his trauma and faults, my dad actually instilled in me a really great work ethic and the belief that I could be any profession I want to be when I grow up. And I admit I'm still dreaming of becoming an astronaut. But it's not just about growing up and being equal to men. Philosopher Ivan Illich asks why anyone would want to be equal in a violent world that will only produce more assaults on women. It's not enough to have gender equality in corporations or in the military which may be taking actions to counter feminist values. We've got to move beyond parity and embrace the values of feminism as well. So number two, we can foster gender awareness. How many of you, when you walk into the room, are aware of gender dynamics? How many women are in the room? I'm not talking about a party where you might be looking for a date. I'm talking about in a conference setting, at work, in the office, etc. I attended a women's college at Columbia University in New York, and I think because of that, it was drilled into my mind to be hyper-conscious of gender everywhere I go. I can't look at a meeting, a panel discussion, a conference, and not count the women speakers. So I couldn't help but notice how only 25% of the people at this conference are women. And I hear that's actually a high number in this industry. Here you can see a TV debate on war on women that doesn't feature a single woman panelist. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely Fox News. So many times I've been at a talk and during the Q&A, men are raising their hands to ask questions and the facilitator's calling on all the guys in the audience. Maybe no women are raising their hands or maybe they just need encouragement to speak up. I've seen very successfully facilitated sessions where a progressive stack is used, alternating between men and women. And where people are encouraged to step up, step up. What that means is to step up your listening if you're someone who talks a lot or to step up your speaking if you've been quiet. Next, we need to kill the alienating atmosphere. Now, this is not a term I, as a pacifist, might use, but I like this terminology a lot. <laughs> I have to say, it's catchy. We have to change the business practices that discriminate against, drive away, or alienate women and minorities. As Martin wrote in his blog, 
Anyone driven away from expressing innovation or writing excellent code is a loss to all of us, however unoffended we think they should be. Business stands to benefit from the traditionally feminine characteristics of cooperation, the capacity for keeping the overall picture at the front of, forefront of decision making, a sense of generosity and collaboration which enhances productive output and creativity. And I'm saying feminine characteristics here, meaning it doesn't mean that you're female bodied, but these characteristics could come from anyone. To increase rep women's representation in tech, we can follow the advice of the Anita Borg Institute for Women in Tech and others. And here's just a few things that they list. Fostering a positive workplace culture, creating diversity of communication styles, looking at how to create a healthy work-life balance and fostering mentorship and teams that value diversity rather than stereotyping and tokenizing women and minorities, evaluating hiring practices, valuing diversity over old models that may fa favor, to put it frankly, white upper middle class men, hiring more women, starting a specific initiative like the ThoughtWorks Global Women in Leadership Development Program, or WILD, and supporting girls who tech, like Rail Girls and Black Girls Code. And this, I want to introduce also the concept of changing maternity and paternity laws. This is Lucia Ronzulli. She's an Italian member of the European Parliament known for bringing her daughter, Vittoria, to all of the Parliament sessions. She started bringing her daughter when she was only 44 days old. It's a symbolic gesture to support more rights for women in reconciling work and family life. This composite picture shows the mother-daughter duo at Parliament sessions over the period of three years. Vittoria will certainly be well prepared to run for office one day. And her story has generated a lot of discussion on family leave policies. Especially considering that only four countries in the world now have no national law regarding paid maternity leave. Liberia, Papua New Guinea, Swaziland, and the illustrious United States, where I come from. We need to honor and pay higher wages for traditionally female work. It's not about increasing the number of women in traditionally male uh, professions, that's not it enough. It's also about uplifting economically and culturally traditionally female work, from housework to nurses to teachers. Why is it that we pay football coaches and actors millions more than we pay professionals who are educating our children and caring for our aging parents? Are not these people the source of a healthy life and the future of our countries? Certainly, they're guarding the next generation a lot more than a primetime sports hero is. And it's not enough for women to rise to the top of traditionally male fields. Traditionally female fields can also be embraced by men. We also need to support the full rights of domestic workers who are mostly women and who deserve, as we all do, a living wage and respectful treatment. This cartoon is an ad for a nanny hotline that uses cell phones and SMS technology in New York City to help net educate nannies in the US on their rights. And we need to educate women and girls. It's a fact that giving women education, work, the ability to control their own income, inherit, and own property benefits society. If a woman's empowered, her children and family will be better off, the family prospers, the village prospers, and eventually so does the whole country. How, who in the room knows who this woman is? Show of hands, quite a lot of you. This is Malala. She's a Pakistani young girl who has been blogging and writing and becoming a fearless spokesgirl for the access to, to education for every girl around the world, but particularly in, the Pakistan, where she, where, in Pakistan where she faces death threats by the Taliban. And she was, as many of you may know, shot and almost killed by a terrorist attack. She's such a brave and noble poster child for this global campaign to get women and girls uh, education, and she's a huge inspiration to me. Every girl deserves an education, but I think we also have to ask ourselves what kind of an education our kids are receiving. Setting up schools in the, quote, third world aided in the insta installment of colonialization. Now, instead of rural children learning from their families and communities the local ways, Kids are being taught English, computer science, and math. Why not? That's where the jobs are. In the current economic system, that's what's going to get kids where they need to go financially. But what gets lost along the way? Indigenous wisdom, practical knowledge. 
If the power goes out or if for some reason there's a natural disaster, global warming, violence, war, etc., and maybe access to imported food is cut off, what will most of us urban dwellers do? Will we try to eat our computers? There's, this kid tried it. I don't think it worked for him. These computers look a little bit more appetizing, but I still don't think that idea is going to work. The fact of the matter is farming and, far and indigenous wisdom and many of the homemaking skills traditionally designated to women are actually essential for our survival and well-being on this planet. The Barefoot College here in India recognizes this and has created programs to uplift and celebrate the talents of the poorest of the poor and the most marginalized in our communities. I've been amazed at how through my travels this past few months in India and Nepal, I meet with elders and also with people my age that have kids in schools, and they tell me, I'm stupid, I don't know anything, my granddaughter knows more than I do, you should ask her. Really? Because I don't know how to make yak cheese or identify which herb is medicinal and which one will kill me. What's happening is an evaluation of different types of knowledge that prioritizes the Western model and schooling over any other type of wisdom. And because in a capitalist system we so strongly value certain employment over others, there naturally comes the drive to want our kids to be doctors, lawyers, and engineers. But we can't lose sight of the holistic interdisciplinary learning that values traditional wisdom and skills. Next up, we've got to educate ourselves. We can educate ourselves about bold women and elevate their profiles. Of all the books in the canons of literature in my college, most of them were men, and most of my heroes growing up were men, except maybe the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and my friend reminded me that they were guys too. ThoughtWorks is cultivating a project to increase the web presence of female heroes and activists by adding Wikipedia profiles for a list of over 50 powerful women, some of them Nobel laureates who don't have much of a web presence. We think of the web as spreading the accessibility of knowledge, and in that sense, power. But if we repeat the same patriarchal patterns online, we're just using another tool for the same end. In the workplace, we can coordinate talks, workshops, and events to better educate ourselves and each other on women's rights. ThoughtWorks also coordinates events on Ada Lovelace Day and Code Jams on International Women's Day, which, by the way, is coming up on March 8th. So you could actually leave this conference and tangibly do something by organizing your office for International Women's Day. Next up, we've got to speak up. Most men obviously are not rapists, but most men may know someone who's been sexually or physically or verbally violent. What do we do when we see violence or hear about it from a friend or family member? Do we speak up or do we stay silent? And I love this quote by Albert Einstein. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch and do nothing. This is a picture of Congolese Dr. Mukwege. He's a visionary and the resident gynecologist at the City of Joy. Here he is receiving a V-Man Award from VDE, uh, the movement to end violence on women and girls. I want to emphasize how crucial a role every man can play in ending violence on women. And in speaking up, I also want to note the importance of working toward acceptance and full rights for people of all genders, not just men and women, but trans and third gender folks too. We've got to expose the truth and make it visible. This is one of my favorite activist groups in India. They're called the Gulabi Gang, and this is a group that was started by Sampat Paul Devi to counter domestic abuse. And rather than be silent and let abuse happen in the home, these women are putting on bright pink saris, surrounding the homes of uh, families where there's domestic abuse, gambling, addiction, alcoholism, etc., and militantly opposing this violence. This is not necessarily what we would call a nonviolent group, but it's a very powerful group and I think has a tremendous message of inspiration to send to all of us. This is another project called Project Unbreakable. It's a 19-year-old photographer who decided to take pictures of her friends holding up quotes of things that their rapists said to them during the horrific act. She put it up on Tumblr and the project went viral and she's received thousands of pictures of women taking back their own voices. We've got to organize. We need strong, vocal, well-supported movements to stop the violence on women until justice is done for every mother, daughter, and sister who has been violated. 
and future generations can think of rape and sexual trauma the same way in the United States we think of segregation and segregated separate fountains for blacks and whites. That it's obviously wrong and illegal. You heard Martin Fowler say this morning, IT professionals here in India and in America are pretty much the world over, are, pr are incredibly privileged. You all, we all have air conditioned offices, nice homes and stable abundant incomes. And that privilege comes with a blessed responsibility to be part of the change. As you heard, you're not just code monkeys, you're brilliant creative people and you can make a difference. Dr. Shiva says that the case of the Delhi gang rape victim changed everything in India. It got young people active, young men marching in the streets for women's rights. Public protests took place in New Delhi where demonstrators were shot with water cannons and tear gas and arrested and still they persisted. More than 600 women belonging to various organizations demonstrated right here in Bangalore. Protests occurred online as well on social networking sites like Facebook and WhatsApp where users replaced their profile images with a black dot. And tens of thousands signed an online petition protesting the incident. This is just one example of creative online and offline coordinated campaigning to raise awareness and stop violence on women. Organizing, I think, looks a lot like Agile. I read over the Agile manifesto and I related a lot to it. Prioritizing individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Organizing is all about relationship building. It's about seeing individuals, making connections. Working software over comprehensive documentation. I started out working with organizations at the UN around climate change and we used to sit around for hours negotiating over whether we should have if, and, or the in the third sentence of the 50 second page of some document no one's ever gonna read. What we need is grassroots, tangible, real change that's connected to the people that it will impact. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We need to form coalitions and interactive organizing. Currently, our movements for social change are partitioned into causes, women's rights, poverty eradication, stopping racism and homophobia, environmental injustice, and so on. But if we fail to see the interconnectedness of these injustices, they will only continue to proliferate like a cancer that sees no organ boundaries. And finally, responding to change over following a plan. And I think Code Pink is very well known for this in the anti-war movement. Whatever the recent headline news is, jumping on it, acting, responding, being committed to a long-term vision, but also being able to be agile, be mobile and strategic. We need to get creative and have fun. You have tech skills to offer, but I'm gonna argue that you have something else, which is radically strategic and successful thinking. This is an image of people spelling out women say no to war with their bodies on the beach. There's an Indian com comedy collective called All India Bakchod that made this sarcastic YouTube about rape and that went viral and reached over three million viewers on YouTube. AIB says every sexual assault case in India inspires a string of stupid and hateful remarks against women and this is our response to those remarks. I started out today showing you the, the video that comes from the One Billion Rising movement. It's a movement to end violence on women and girls that contains a campaign every year on February 14th on, Internet, on uh, Valentine's Day where women take to the streets and organize creative flash mobs and dances to expose this issue and mobilize more people to get involved. And I wanna highlight just one resource that might be of interest to you. A team of colleagues and I collaborate on, collaborated on this book. It's hot off the presses. It's called Beautiful Trouble. And it's a guide for activist tactics and principles. It's like an encyclopedia for ruckus ranging change makers. It's a book on tactics and principles. We also talk about theories and case studies. And you can also read it online. So I didn't schlep copies all the way to India and backpack with them through Nepal. And I can't sign any for you, but you can read the entire thing online and you can also check out the beta visualization version of the book. Fast Company wrote in a review of the book, although the book is geared toward the activist community, many of the tactics and ideologies discussed lend themselves to startups and even the corporate world quite easily. Sections of the book like putting your target in a decision dilemma and simple rules can have grand results, even fit in perfectly with the corpus of business leadership literature. So check it out. And finally, what do all these women that you see up here have in common? They're bold, they're fearless, and they're audacious. 
well-behaved women rarely make history. Or as the great novelist Isabella Allende put it, we need mavericks, dissidents, adventurers, outsiders, and rebels who ask questions, bend the rules, and take risks. Nice people with common sense do not make interesting characters. We all have fear, fear of losing our unique privileges, possibly fear of losing our wealth or our loved ones. Fear also drives sexism and war. But these women show us that it's possible to transcend our fears and be a visible, vocal presence for a different paradigm. A paradigm where we belong to each other, where our successes are contingent rather than competitive against each other's successes. And I'm gonna make the assumption here and venture to say, based on what I've seen from all of you over the past eight hours, the first day of this conference, that you have the same boldness, the same audacity, the same courage that I see in these women that I've told you the stories about today. Agile went out on a limb and questioned business as usual. It created a foundation for collaborative workspace, for more communication, for acceptance of failure and big picture thinking broken down into bite-sized steps. And that's exactly what's needed in our movements for justice today. Thinking outside the box, boldness, audacity, courage, and fearless conviction. And with that boldness, what can you do? The possibilities are endless. One in three women will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. But sexual violence affects more than one third of our society. I wanna ask you right now to please stand up if you know someone who's been sexually assaulted, maybe a neighbor, a friend, a loved one, someone you met randomly on the plane, please stand up. Thank you and please stay standing. Stand up if you have either ever witnessed someone make an appropriate, inappropriate comment to a woman in the office, some kind of sexual harassment in your office. Thank you. Please stay standing. And now please stand up if you believe violence on women and girls must end. Take a moment to look around the room. This is a movement in the making. We are all in this together. It's time we do more than speak words. We stand up, take action, and as Gandhi said, be the change that we want to see. Together, we can end violence on women and girls. Thank you.